Johnny and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business? We can help. A reminder, our title sponsor, Donnie and Dolly, Able Auctions, ableauctions.ca. Canucks hosting Arizona tonight, their final preseason game before they open the uh, regular season next Wednesday up in Edmonton. Here to talk about the Vancouver Canucks, as always on a Friday, from the Athletic, Thomas Drance. How are you, sir? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, <it's> just... <laughs> Jay's noted power. Toronto guy, noted Toronto guy, Thomas yeah. Drance, yeah. reporting for duty. I grew up in the in the Toronto neighborhood of Carisdale, mm. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and went and went to noted Toronto school, Colchina, <laughs> and there you go. Wow, <laughs> Big Toronto guy. Y- you realize you and Rick are on the same page. I'm not. I do. Yeah, and that's well, a that's- first. That's the yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, look, I'm scared of Castillo today. I'm going to admit it. I'm scared of Castillo. That arm strength, that change up, that could be a problem for the Blue Jays offense. But at the end of the day, the Mariners are a franchise that is going to do what they do best. And that's capitulate the way they did in this market over the last 25 years. Yeah. No, I, I'm not going to argue. I, I, I want to see them win. I do. But let's face it. I call the Mariners the weakest pro sports franchise in the Pacific Northwest. You know why? Because they are. Yeah, 21 they years. They made the playoffs four or five times uh, now. Yeah. Okay, but let's talk about the Canucks, uh, uh, Thomas. I could see you were, you were enthralled by what I was talking about regarding the Mariners. <laughs> what can you tell us about Canucks in Arizona tonight? Uh, number 88 is going to be in the lineup. What can you tell us about Nils Oman, whom Bruce Boudreaux and everyone else in the Canuck organization seem so high on? Yeah, I th- think he, Nils Oman has absolutely turned some heads, and – in the case of both him and Linus Carlson, like one of the things I'm hearing a lot from the organization is it's not just about what you can see these guys do on the ice, right? In Neil Zaman's case, you see the size, you see the speed. His skating ability is not just NHL level, but high-end NHL level. You see the hockey IQ away from the puck. Uh, you don't really see it with the puck, right? His skill level is, is decidedly bottom six. But you see that package of tools, and it's exciting for a 22-year-old player a rookie to north american pro hockey to come into camp and and show what he's shown but what's really stood out to the canucks about both of these guys is the maturity and the character that they've demonstrated off of the ice away from the rink in terms of being around the group um you know in linus carlson i think that's manifested itself a little bit in a real understanding that whether he makes this team or not out of camp there's a confidence that he's going to get his shot which you know you love to see and an understanding that hey look if i go back go down to the American League and play 22 minutes a night, that might be best for him. Um, in Oman's case, uh, you know, a core of competitive steel, I think he's been really impressive to the group by the way that he's worked throughout this camp, by the way that they've thrown him into tough matchups uh, and and he's handled himself. Um, you know, in in sort of writing our piece yesterday, Rick and I encountered a story about, uh, you know, from, from some Swedish contacts told to us about Niels Oman breaking his hip and, mm-hmm. you know, gets – gets the keys to the rink and uh, is there every night rebuilding his stride. It shows his skating is an absolute asset. You know, we're now seven years removed from that moment in Oman's life. And he might be on the verge of making his NHL debut next week. I I think going into this final preseason game and while, you know, our Canucks sources tell us insist that no final decisions have been made. uh, You know, I I would probably put him as the front runner. Yep. to yep. have have won this team's job to be the opening night fourth line center. Yep. Dakota Joshua, or as Rick refers to him, Joshua Dakota, <laughs> what can you tell us about him? and a lot of other people as well um, yeah. to, to be on your side here, uh, Rick. Uh, what can you tell us about his status? Yeah, look, I mean, Joshua is going to be on this team, and I think he's going to get a long look. I think there's going to be more opportunity for him. I think we've seen that already. There's been opportunity for him in the preseason – He brings something in terms of his size, speed, and ability to impact a game with his physical play that no one else can in this Canucks forward group, frankly. And yet, you know, I do think that needs to be brought consistently, right? And I do think the organization believes that. 
Um, you know, you look at the game that he played where he fought John Hayden. It was the Seattle Kraken game. You remember that? And mm -hmm. uh, Hayden gets that cheap shot in. And I think there was a feeling after that game and after those two Kraken games where, you know, you saw Joshua level Michael Kempney with just a clean, heavy hit, uh, you know, where the organization was like, yeah, this is what we need. This is exactly why we brought this guy in. And then you see him on the ice when Darnell Nurse clotheslines mm -hmm. Hoaglander and there's no pushback. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's not even the... And, and it's, you know, I don't think it's an expectation that this guy be a fighter, uh, that he regularly impact the game that way. It's just that you want to see him do like Tanner Pearson does, right? Where it's like, yeah. no questions asked, didn't even see the hit on Pedersen. I'm going over and, and making that yeah. guy's life miserable for a few minutes. Um, you know, I think there is a hope that that'll be brought consistently. I think it has to be brought consistently if he's going to continue to get the plum opportunities that he has to this point. Uh, clear message, clear message from the organization to a player that they're very high on, make no mistake, uh, but that they want to see that level of sort of consistent um, understanding of, of, of what he needs to do to help this team win. Thomas, what do you see with Jason Dickinson? Okay, uh, waivers, is it a possibility in the next few days? Uh, you know, is he, when everybody gets healthy, is he in the press box? How are they going to maneuver this situation all, all, all year long in your eyes? Well, Rick, I'm about to put Donnie to sleep, so uh, Ryan, maybe <laughs> grab him a pillow. Um, <laughs> the Canucks need to capture the full amount of Michael Furlan's $3.5 million, right? And right, it's not right. as simple as just being like, it's on LTI, magic, $3.5 in cap space. Yeah. Um, LTI space functions differently from cap space. What you need to do is be as close to 81.5 or 82.5, the upper limit as you can, and then put Michael Furlan's contract on LTI. And the amount of space you get from that is how is the 3.5 million minus whatever money remains between, you know, your, your position and the upper limit of the salary cap. Right. So right. The, the, it's, it's just a really complicated set of dynamics that the Canucks are going to have to go through here. And, and one of the main things we wrote this morning, Rick, over at the athletic in our piece, what we're hearing about the, the Canucks plans uh, ahead of final cuts um, is the injury situation really complicates this, yeah. particularly because, you know, we're hearing that the Besser and Mikhaev injuries probably aren't long term. Yeah. Right. And every injured player has to be accounted for when you set your opening day roster, when you do this Furland capture, you know, um, move. Uh, so, you know, if you put Mikhaev and Besser on IR, for example, you lose them for four games. You lose them for eight, uh, seven days. Um, if you put them on LTI, you lose them for the entire month of October. We all know that those two players are too compli are too important for this team to sort of risk doing that, particularly if there's a chance that they're playing in Philadelphia, Washington, or Columbus. So, um, you know, I think that the club is going to have to strongly consider carrying 14 forwards yeah. on their opening day roster. And I think mm -hmm. there's uh, several players who could well be on that opening day roster who may have to be waived on Monday – at the latest, maybe yep. Tuesday, or sorry, maybe maybe Sunday, um, who are still in the club's plans. And Jason Dickinson would be a prime candidate for that. You know, yep. this isn't me reporting it. This is me doing the math and building my own model and trying to figure out exactly what sort of set of considerations the Canucks are looking at. You know, to get to the point where you can maximize your furlough capture, you know, waving Dickinson just might be an absolute necessity. And yet... I think he's absolutely going to be in the opening night lineup. I think he's going to be a key penalty killer for them. I think they've been pretty happy with the jump that he's shown through camp uh, and with his work four on five through camp. So uh, I, I think it'll be more a reflection of the financial realities and the injury situation that this club is dealing with than it would be, uh, you know, about his form. And he's not the only player for whom this applies. We could see the a couple of guys who are very much in the Canucks plans who nonetheless have to be exposed to waivers as the Canucks look to, you know, complete the paper transactions required to make sure they have the space to really get through this season and, and ice a full lineup every night. Coffee's strong today. I had no problem staying awake for that, for that whole answer. <laughs> Just so you know, uh, Thomas, what's your take? Because we, we, all over the NHL these days, you know, who's the first coach that's going to be uh, uh, fired? A lot of people say Bruce Boudreaux. What's your take on his job security? Well, although a lot of people say it, the last time I saw it, Donnie, it was 65 to 1 odds um, mm. for Bruce Boudreaux on Vegas. He was like one of the longest shots. So mm. uh, Vegas, anyway, isn't buying that theory. Vegas okay. clearly – Vegas 
clearly owns a lot of Bruce Boudreaux stock. And why wouldn't they? All the guy does is win in the regular season. Um, what's my take on it? I think the fact that he took over had the impact he did, right? And I don't think it's too strong to call that impact transformative, right? Considering the way that he's resonated in this city with this fan base. And the fact that he mm-hmm. was the club declined to sign him to an extension can't do anything but speak volumes, right? Not to mention the pointed commentary uh, that we saw, you know, from Alvin and Rutherford at the end of the season. I, I mean, I think to discount that and and assume that it's all hunky dory would be naive in the extreme. Um, yeah. You know, this team's got a lot to prove early on this season, and you know. Boudreaux is obviously incentivized to win as much as he can. I think his interests align with the organization there. Uh, and yet, you know, I, I'm not sure how strong that alignment is. You can you can kind of smell it, too, in some of the answers. Some of the like, mm-hmm. oh, that's Patrick's concern. That's my concern. Like, I, I think there are some seams that have shown on occasion uh, in regards to, you know, the organization's precise posture. And yet, you know, I, I think you're if you're betting against Bruce Boudreaux winning games in the regular season, um, you know, I, I hope you uh, I hope you're not betting too much on that because no one's ever won a lick of money betting on Boudreaux losses in the yeah. regular season. At the end of the day, if this team has success, uh, they're going to you know, he's going to he's going to be able to punch his ticket, especially in this market. Here's my prediction. Uh, you join us next Friday. You will be wearing a Mariners hat. OK. Oh, I don't I, I definitely don't own one. <laughs> exactly. Rick will buck wanna, up and send yeah. you one. Like like ninety nine point nine percent of other Vancouverites, I don't own any Mariners gear. Thank <laughs> you. Who are the Mariners? Well, <laughs> uh, well, like like I said earlier, they've given you reason not to yeah. be a fan. Well, twenty one years. I, I want to see I, that hat next Friday. I will say an awful lot of Blue Jays fans. I feel like if the if the Mariners beat them, are going to be rooting for the Mariners in the next series, right? And I mean, one thing that I think Blue Jays and Mariners fans have in common, right? is that no matter how this series turns out, everyone's going to be rooting against the Yankees and the Astros. So that uh, should be fun one way or the other. Thomas, thanks for this. All the best. Thanks, boys.